Hi, welcome to this unit test study guide, however you prefer to use it, on matter. Now, this is not the entirety of unit eight. Most of the time, my unit eight is matter and energy together. But because of the upcoming holidays, I am going to be taking a pause on this YouTube channel. I hope that you take a pause as well. Take some time to enjoy your family. And um, this is where we are going to end for the new year. Um, and I will see you again in January, which sounds kind of crazy. This year went very quickly. Um, but we're going to do a few things to review matter before you go. Um, and let's get started. All right. The title of this slide is physical and chemical properties and changes. So if you have an issue with this question for any reason, please make sure to go back to this particular video, get some review. And that is true for any of these slides. To begin, what is the difference between a physical and a chemical property and give two examples of each. I like to describe properties as adjectives. A property is going to describe the way that a substance looks, smells, feels, the sample size, the color, the texture, lots of different options there. Um, so a physical property is going to be observed with the five senses. The chemical property, on the other hand, is going to describe how the substance reacts. So in that case, we would say something like it's flammable or it can oxidize in this situation. It may react with this particular chemical. That is how we would describe chemical properties. The next question, what is the difference between a physical and chemical change? Give two examples of each. I like to describe changes as verbs. So in a physical change, you have no bonds broken and no bonds formed. All you will have is some type of change in appearance. Um, so in this case, all of your phase changes are going to be physical changes. So melting, freezing, boiling, condensing, subliming, and depositing. All of those phase changes are physical changes. And then anytime you change the shape, so if you had a sample of salt and then you ground it up with a mortar and pestle, you crushed it, a piece of paper that you tear, something to that effect, all of that is going to be just a physical change. In chemical changes, new bonds are formed, old bonds are broken. In that case, we're going to be talking about specific reactions, like perhaps the Haber process, which is the formation of ammonia from its elements. But you can also talk about combustion, single replacement, formation of a precipitate. Um, chemical changes are really just chemical reactions. For this slide, determine which class of matter is listed for each of these examples. If it can be found on the periodic table, that makes it an element. Gold is on the periodic table. Its symbol is AU. Oil and water, you should know, is a mixture. The plus sign really is an indicator that that is a mixture. They're in the same place at the same time. Then we have copper to chloride. And from the bonding unit, you know that if it's written like that, it means that those two compounds are bonded together. The IDE is a big indicator that the chlorine has been bonded. So that is going to make copper two chloride a compound. Salt water is a mixture. <laughs> that one's kind of easy from your real life. Salt and water in the same place at the same time. C, capital O, is a compound. C, bonded to O. Um, because it's two capitals, that's how you would know it's a compound. If it were a capital C and a lowercase o, that would be the element cobalt. It's really important to mind your capital letters. Lastly, we have Br2. Even though it's a bromine bonded to another bromine, this is an element. Don't fall for it. Bromine is a diatomic element, and that is how bromine exists in nature. Um, so watch those twos. That is an element because it's the same um, element bonded to itself. So it's pure. Looking at these particle diagrams, identify the phase of matter as well as the class of matter. First up, we have a solid compound. I know this because we have a pretty definite shape here. All of our atoms are in a repeating pattern. And this is a compound because it's made of two different types. That's important to note. This second particle diagram is a mixture with a liquid component. There is not a lot of organization here. It kind of looks like we have a shape. I tried to put it in a glass kind of sort of, um, but there's no definite shape. All of these 
um, there's, there's not a lot of organization here. That's how we can piece it together. Um, and then this is a mixture because we have these kind of Mickey Mouse shaped things and then we have these floating circles in between. Um, so this looks like it's something dissolved in water. Last up, we have this over here. We have a mixture. I'm sorry, this is not a mixture. This is, <laughs> this is an element and it's a gas. I know this is a gas because there's a lot of space between my particles. And just like before, this is a diatomic element. Two atoms of the same type bonded together. Last up in the matter section was separation of mixtures. So here we go, hypothetical. How would you separate a mixture of each? The best way to separate salt and water would be in evaporation. The salt will evaporate up into the atmosphere and the salt will be left behind in the evaporating dish. For sand and salt, this is kind of a tough one um, because the grains are roughly the same size, so you can't like sift them out from each other. The best way to do this would be to dissolve the whole sample in water. If you've been to the beach, you know that the ocean is salty, but the sand does not dissolve in water. So if you were to add water to a mixture of sand and salt, the salt would kind of disappear. Not really, but visually it would. It would dissolve into the water, making salt water and leaving the sand behind. Then you could use a filter or a filtration situation and catch the sand in a filter and the salt water will drip down. And then finally you would do an evaporation because your sand would be caught the filter paper and then your salt water, you would separate the same way you would separate the salt water here. Oil and water, quickest way to do that would be a separatory funnel. You could distill it, but uh, if you were my student and you tried to distill oil, I would be very upset that you dirtied up my distillation setup. Last, alcohol and water. Alcohol is a really clean chemical. Um, it's very nice to distill. Very, uh, it doesn't leave behind a residue is my point. So alcohol and water, especially because they're a homogeneous mixture, you can't put them in a separatory funnel. Alcohol and water are a perfect uh, mixture for a distillation. And that's all. So again, if you had trouble with any of these, go back to the original video, check them out. If there's any questions beyond that, please feel free, drop them in the comments. I will be addressing comments because um, I want you to do well. I want you to feel successful. All right, that's all. Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss the comeback in January. Excited to see you there. Bye.